So the next speaker will be Henrik Wahlmann from Sweden, and he will present the work about uh, a permeability approach that has been or is used by the Transport Administration. So, Henrik, hello. The floor is yours. Yep. So, hello everyone. I'm Henrik Molman from Sweden, and I work for Enviro Planning, a consultancy firm in Sweden with about 30 employees, which of three of us is here today, which is quite good, I think. And today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, permeability assessment for large mammals that has been done in Sweden. And uh, it's done together with the National Transport Administration. And it has really had a big impact on the way Sweden works with permeability and uh, barrier effects. So, uh, the permeability assessment is aimed at large mammal and it is used widely within the transport system. The model provides a quantification of uh, infrastructure barrier impact as well as identification of permeability deficiencies. And also, it makes it possible to, to rank these uh, deficiencies, to work with them in a strategic way. And this GIS-based model was developed back in 2015, so it has a few years, uh, but it's been a real game changer for us. So it's been made it possible for the government to set like a, a, an overarching target and provide funding to the transport administration. And the Transport Administration, in turn, has been able to set regulatory goals and, and funding to the regional level. And at the regional level, it's been possible to prioritize between different sections of infrastructure for mitigation. So why did we start with the gray infrastructure, the roads and the railroads, and not the green infrastructure? Well, Compared to most of the rest of Europe, Sweden is very sparsely populated and it's mostly covered by woodlands. So, although we have a lot of infrastructure, it's, compared to the most of Europe, we don't. But uh, the, the green infrastructure in Sweden is not evident as it is in many other places. So, it's mostly it's the uh, infrastructure in itself that limits habit, uh, the animals' movements and not the, the habitat. So, the model's based on moose, uh, and moose is the most, uh, why we chose moose is because it's the most uh, demanding species when it comes to passage dimensions. It needs the biggest passages to function. So, uh, uh, knowledge about moose home range size and patterns of movement has been combined with previous research on the efficacy of different types of passages, uh, and that is like the crossing points like bridges and viaducts. And one key takeaway that has come from this is a document that the National Transport Administration has set, and that's the National Guideline for Landscape, which has had a huge impact on the work we do at the, tra on the, the work the Transport Administration does. So this guideline sets ambitious goals for permeability at the landscape level. It states, among other things, that all infrastructure shall be adapted to the landscape so it doesn't limit movement from the, for the wild animals. And it's, uh, no animals should actually be killed. I mean, that's a bold statement, and we're quite a long way from reaching that. But just to set the goal and state that this is the goal is, is a key factor for working with this. So, since this uh, has already been presented at IENE and several other conferences before, the barrier model in itself for the permeability assessment, I will not go into a lot of detail, but just give you a short background for your understanding. And basically, the model has three steps. At the first step, you identify potential infrastructure barriers, and this is done by, uh, I'll get back to how it's done. And in the second step, all bridges and viaducts uh, are examined as they are potential passages, safe passages, and then we rate the passage efficacy of these passages. And combining these two, 
we identify unsolved barriers. Oh. So, the criteria for potential barriers. Uh, they are identified through an extensive GIS analysis, which take into account several factors that has a barrier effect, like the traffic volume, the speed limit, uh, wildlife fencing, and so on. And this analysis identifies where the barriers uh, for large mammals are, could not, where the animals cannot or should not cross. Yeah, I think you can actually read it. So these are like, the, the, these are two data sets. Uh, when we put them on the national level, these are the barriers for roads and railroads. And the, the railroads are shorter in total than the roads. But you can also note that the larger proportion of the railroad is considered barriers than for the roads. And then the passages, the crossing points. We, we classify the, the potential bridges and viaducts into functional passages, mostly based on their ge geometry, like the width and the height and the length. But other factors are also considered, like water, if it's filled with water, or if there are too many cars inside, and so on. And in total, some 3,500 passages uh, were, uh, were considered uh, along these uh, barriers. And they were given a theoretical functional class. And note that most of these passages, even the functional ones, are conventional uh, bridges, not fauna passages, but they're made for the, the forestry or some other use. So then the... These passages and, and, and the class is allometrically scaled into relative barrier dissolving potential. So a fully functional passage is considered to dissolve the barrier for two kilometers for each side from the passage. And if you have a less functioning passage, then the, this distance decreases. And in the national guideline for landscape, a, a set value of six kilometers is of barrier, then you need to mitigate if it's longer than six kilometers. So, what does this give us? Let's look at an example from Gothenburg here. Uh, and you can see the identified barriers, it's the, uh, the red lines, and the potential passages uh, like uh, in, that has been classified into barrier dissolving circles. And mitigation needs in the form of longer barriers is obviously visible from just from the map alone. But aggregated, this also gives a national level. So you can sum it up from, for all of it. And in that, we can say that 646 passages are needed to make the Swedish infrastructure permeable, which is a lot. And it will take some time to get there. So what has this done in conclusion? The permeability infrastructure assessment has established a baseline about the extent of the barrier problem within Sweden. And with this information, the Swedish government has been able to set an overarching target and allocate funding to the transport administration. And the tra transport administration has made the functional uh, or the landscape uh, oh the national guidelines for landscape uh, and the target and also allocate funding further down to the regional level and at the regional level you can help to prioritize at that but of course this one is also combined with other data sets like the wildlife accidents and, and several other things then to give a good foundation for handling this issue and that's it one of the most passing uh, fauna passage in Sweden. And I'd like to take this to th thank my co-authors and everything, and also the tra Transport Administration for funding us so we could be here today. Thank you.